Hi, my name is Brian Kelly. I'm a computer engineering student at Purdue University, and I'm going to show you the dual-core MIPS processor that I've designed. It's targeted at an Altera FPGA, and some of the features it includes are a five-stage pipeline, a 16-word instruction cache, a 64-word two-way set associative write-back data cache, and as I've said before, it includes two cores. It uses the MSI protocol to maintain coherence between those two cores and supports cache-to-cache -cache transfers using a Snoopy bus. I've also implemented memory mapped I.O. support for button inputs, LED outputs, and a 16 by 2 character LCD module. So I'm going to demonstrate um, my processor by showing you a couple programs. Uh, this first one is a reverse Polish notation for function calculator. Uh, you can add, subtract, multiply, and divide. Um, as you can see, uh, I have an Altera Cyclone 2 FPGA right there. Uh, that's running my dual core processor on it. Uh, this software demonstration actually only uses one core, uh, but you'll see a dual core program later. Um, as you can see, uh, we've got this 16 by 2 character LCD. Uh, I'll, I'll explain that a little bit more in a second. Uh, we have eight seven segment displays. Uh, this displays the decimal version of the number that you've inputted on these dip switches down here. Uh, I have 15 bits of input for that. Uh, and then I have this dip switch right here, uh, which provides uh, sort of an alternate button, because uh, I only have three buttons over here. So, um, if you're not familiar with a reverse Polish notation calculator, uh, basically, unlike traditional uh, calculators where you enter in a number and then the operand and then another number and hit equals, um, in reverse Polish notation, you enter in both of the operands and then you tell it what operation to do to those operands. So, for instance, um, I wanted to add 14 and 3, I would enter in 14, see, right there, uh, press the enter key to enter that into our stack, uh, which you can see right here, uh, and then if I wanted to add 3 to that, I would say, oh, hey, here's 3, uh, I would press enter again, uh, and then you can see our stack has two numbers on it, 14 and 3. So then, uh, you go over here and hit the add button, and it should pop both of those operands off the stack, add them together, and push it back onto the stack. And obviously the answer will be 17. So, here we go. Yay, 17. Uh, as you saw, I pressed the button down once and it didn't do anything. That's actually the board. Uh, these buttons are very stiff, so yeah, you have to kind of push down really, really hard. Um, so let's say I wanted to subtract... Uh, 48 from 17. Uh, so this is the result from our previous calculation. Uh, it's still on the stack. So I add 48 to the stack and then I press the subtraction key. <laughs> Again, uh, and you can see that the answer is negative 31, which is correct. So with three buttons down here, uh, you can Obviously tell that there aren't very many operations we can do, uh, actually only two, because uh, you need the enter button and then you have add and subtract. Um, but I've added this button over here that I call an alternate switch, uh, and when that is enabled, these three buttons turn into something else. Uh, the enter key will actually take off the last result from the stack, uh, the addition key turns into a multiplication key, and the subtraction key turns into a division key. So, uh, we have our previous result of negative 31. So, we could just leave that on the stack and leave it there forever while we do more operations. Uh, but we have this enter key, which is now sort of a, a delete key, so we can just take it off. Uh, and then, as you can see, there's nothing on the stack, so it goes back to the splash screen. Uh, so, let's just say we want to multiply uh, 100. Hold on. Uh, so we uh, enter in 100, and then let's just say we want to multiply it by 24. So we're going to enter that in as well. Uh, we flip our alternate switch, and then we press the addition key, which is now the multiplication key. And as you can see, uh, the answer is 2400, which is what we expect. 
So, uh, now that we have 2400, uh, let's just see what happens when we try to divide by 2. Actually, no, let's divide by 3. That might be. Uh, so, we have 3 on our input. Uh, we're going to enter it onto the stack and then uh, enable the alternate button and press the division key and see what happens. Uh, 800. Awesome. That's, that's the group. Let's that's try to divide by 5 again. Uh, so, I'm going to remember to flip down the alternate key again uh, to enter that onto the stack. Uh, and then we're going to divide by five. Ta-da! Okay, uh, well, this is all pretty non-interesting. Uh, so, uh, let's divide by ten. Uh, make sure our Alt key is down. Enter it onto the stack. Uh, press the Alt key. Divide. As you can see, uh, the answer is 16, which is correct. Uh, but then we're going to divide by 10 again, uh, so that you can see this is just integer division. Uh, no floating point here. So, uh, yep, 1. Yeah, the correct answer is 1.6, uh, but it just sort of lops off the end. Um, all the multiplication and division is actually done in software. Um, since the FPGA is running at 27 megahertz, and we're just using user input. Uh, that's really not a big deal at all. Um, but there, the the ALU just supports addition and subtraction operations, uh, as well as shifting and uh, stuff like that. But uh, no hardware multiple or multiply or divide. Uh, the critical path really would uh, blow up if I tried to do that. So uh, so far, just addition and uh, subtraction in the ALU. But as you can see, uh, this performs very well. Uh, obviously, you can't see the result being updated or anything. So, um, all right, let's uh, do a more complex operation. Uh, so, take away our... Okay, uh, so let's say we want to do um, 1 minus 5 times 8. So, first we're going to put in uh, 1. Hey, it worked. Uh, not really. I'm, I'm not surprised it worked. It, it has been. Uh, okay, so I said 1 minus 5 times 8. So then we're going to input 5 and 8. Oh, it actually added another one. Uh, these buttons, as I said, are pretty bad. So uh, we're going to take it away. All right, so we have 1, 5, and then we're going to add 8. So uh, now we have... Uh, the two operands that we want to multiply. Uh, so we turn on our alt switch and press multiply. And we see 40. And then uh, we want to subtract 40 from 1. Uh, so we turn our alt switch off and press the subtraction key. And we get negative 39, which is the correct answer. Stay tuned for our next demonstration. So now, as I promised, I would show you a little demonstration of the dual-core performance of the processor. Um, here we have a, a sort program that does a, an insertion sort on each half of the data uh, and then merges it together. Um, I, I've written it so that we can choose whether to run a dual-core version or a single-core version. Uh, in the dual-core version, uh, each core runs its own insertion sort in parallel uh, and then signals to the other that it's done, and then one of the cores merges the data together to come up with a fully sorted uh, final result. Um, and then the single core uh, sorts one half with an insertion sort, and then sort, uh, sorts the other half with an insertion sort, and then merges them. Uh, pretty much the same, just uh, in series rather than in parallel. Um, so I, I implemented a little uh, memory mapped timer, um, and the results will show up here uh, to measure the runtime of the program. Uh, over here will be milliseconds, uh, and then over here will be microseconds. Uh, the timer has a one microsecond resolution, so yes. All right, uh, so I'm going to go ahead and, and hit key two here, and we'll, we'll see this program run. So uh, it took about 534 milliseconds to run. Um, 
and then let me reprogram this so that we can get uh, freshly unsorted data for the second test. Alright, uh, and then we're going to run the single core version and see what that comes out to be. Comes out to be about uh, three fourths of a second or uh, 787 milliseconds. Um, so since everything is repeatable on this, uh, I pre-computed this, uh, it, it's about a 50% increase in performance. Um, so the thing about this program is that uh, it does a lot of memory accesses. Uh, so a 50% in, in increase in performance is actually pretty good considering uh, both cores are pretty much constantly vying for memory from each other. Um, so uh, a performance increase of 50% is, uh, although there's two cores, uh, it, it's still reasonable. Uh, and definitely not something to shake your fist at. Uh, so I ran this earlier, um, and you can see, hopefully it focuses, oh it does, nice. Um, you can see that this data uh, is all sorted there in the memory. Uh, and it, I forgot to mention earlier, uh, but the program that you saw running uh, was sorting through 2,000 records, uh, which turns out to be about a quarter of a millisecond per record. Um, I've tried it on another on other numbers of records as well, uh, and the benefit seems to be the same at about 50%, until you get down to about 100, in which case it drops off to 30%. I would be lying if I said I did it all by myself, uh, so I want to thank Dan Ehrman, who was my lab partner throughout the semester, uh, and I'd also like to thank the staff of uh, EC437, uh, Purdue professors uh, Dr. Johnson and Professor Vijay Kumar, uh, for setting up a good class, and then our, our TA, uh, Eric Villasenor. Thanks, guys. Um, and also, thank you for watching this video. Uh, if you have any more questions or want more detailed schematics or details, uh, you can find them on my website at realmb.com. Thanks.